This is Divine Lifestyles with Tara Magalski. What is a divine lifestyle? Passion, purpose, and living in alignment with your truth. This is Tara Magalski from Divine Lifestyles, feeding your spirit, mind, and body. And today's guest is a new buddy of mine, Judah Swilly, who is an indie hip hop artist from Atlanta. Now he working with some of the biggest names in music and he's been featured on TV, radio, released multiple albums and performs at festivals and venues around the country. Now he is moving and shaking and he has been performing since the age of 12. And through his music he is doing some really great work and he has launched a nonprofit organization with a mission of igniting small businesses that have big ideas by raising funds and awareness for their causes through benefit concerts, which is, we're gonna talk about that in just a few minutes. But he also runs a production company and he is also a youth pastor. So as you can see, this guy is all over the place. Thank you so much for joining me today. Definitely. Just give me a rundown of you know, how you grew up because I know you have a great, crazy, amazing story. Yeah, so like you said a minute ago, I, I kind of wear a lot of hats to do a lot of different things. Um, everything from music to ministry to outreach. Uh, to business, and I love uh, being involved with different things. I think it's a, uh, a great way to uh, use variety to reach the world. Um, I think that if you kind of get complacent and you pick one lane to stay in, sometimes that can slow you down. Uh, for me, the destination has always been to change the world. Uh, the vehicle might change, so I'm cool with the vehicle being music or television or radio. It doesn't matter as long as we get to where we're going, and uh, so that's kind of my philosophy with life. That's why I like to be involved with uh, a variety of different things. Tell me a little bit about your, your voice, your mission, like what you are putting out into the world. So as far as my mission goes with Ignite, uh, basically it started as a college ministry actually in Athens, Georgia. And the reason I started that is I would go out with some of my friends, we'd get some drinks or whatever, and you would always see people on the corner of the block uh, yelling at you, telling you that God hates you, telling you that you're going to hell, just for having some fun. Like no one's being irresponsible, no one's being out of control. But if you want to go have a beer or two, uh, you know, and, and, and dance a little bit, I think that's okay. Uh, some of those people didn't. So they're in your face telling you these things. And to me, being uh, a college town in Athens, you know, kids aren't going to hear that. They're not going to listen to that, and they're not going to follow that. If, if they think that that's how God operates and that's how God looks at you uh, through, an eye, through eyes of hate and judge, uh, judgmentalism, they're going to come to Christ. So for me, I started Ignite out of a passion to show people the love of God. Then, I don't know if you've ever read something before that you've read a million times, but it's like a revelations on it that you've never seen before. And so for me, I've read Matthew 25 so many times, but I read it one day and it saw it with a different light. And it's where Jesus basically defines righteousness as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting those that are sick, visiting those in prison. In other words, he talks about, how it's about what you do, not just about what you think. What you think is important and it, and it definitely has to do with your life, but what you do is so vital for the world. So if you're just telling people God loves them, that's cool. But if you're showing them God loves them, that is absolutely amazing. And for me, I felt like I wasn't showing people God loves them enough. So we shifted the whole mission of Ignite to not just tell people, but to show people. So that's why we're out here in these streets. We're uh, you know, getting involved with different organizations. We don't want to just recreate a wheel. We want to help other wheels spin. So with Ignite, we find you know, a small organization that has a big idea. And we go in there and we raise money. We raise awareness for those guys. And we do a lot of other programs as well. And I'm very on, you know, on fire for that, igniting people and igniting organizations. I love it. I love it. I love it. So let's talk a little bit about how you grew up because you must have had some sort of, was your family in ministry? Because yeah. how did you fall into being a youth pastor? Yeah. So for me, like I grew up in ministry. I'm fifth generation pastor. Everyone in my family is in the ministry. So when we get together for family reunions, like uncles, cousins, <laughs> granddaddies, great granddaddies, everybody has a church. So it's a little, you know, it's fun, but it's competitive and it's, it's different. <laughs> and, and, uh, it's a very interesting situation. But so for me, I have this legacy on my life to do ministry. Everyone in my family has done it for so long, ministry and music. And so it was always kind of like, this is what you do. This is the line that you fall into. But that's not the reason I do it. Um, I awakened to my own relationship with Christ. You know, I've always known Christ, but until you really form a relationship with him, you don't really experience it. And so once I woke up to that in my life, uh, I wanted to get involved more with ministry and more with outreach. And I saw the power that you can um, display for the world. You can actually help someone. You may not, you know, some people think they can't change the entire world. I, I'm crazy enough to think that, 
But even if you can't change the entire world, you know what you can change? You can change your world. And if you change your world and I change my world and he changes his world and she changes her world, we collectively change the world. So for me, ministry was a way to do that. Just one avenue, just one vehicle to help get to that destination of changing the world. So um, ministry has always been a part of my family. It's in my blood, but it's also one of my passions because not only uh, am I good at it, but I love to do it. It's, it's, I'm very, it, it just gives me life. So you were saying that not until you were able to have your own experience with Christ, what, did, what was that moment for you? Because I know, so, the, yeah. Yeah. Well, I've had a, multiple moments, um, but for me, I, I guess like, you know, growing up, you always believe and you're like, all right, God's real, whatever, whatever, but like, I don't really know God yet. And so for me, I was like 13 years old. I went to the Philippines on a missions trip. Uh, my dad was covering like 150 churches or something like that at the time. He's a bishop. And so we were out there, we were ministering out in these jungles. Like people didn't have running water. They didn't have uh, food. They didn't have electricity or anything. So we would go in these tents and just like minister to these people and like pray for them and give them food and all this kind of good stuff. And I saw the power of God show up in those places. And so for me, it became uh, something that wasn't just believed and just wasn't something that was just thought, but it was something that was acted out. And uh, that, that, that was what was real for me. So be a little bit more specific how you saw that, because some of our listeners might not understand that. How did you see the power of God working in those villages? Like I saw healings take place. I saw people who were broken, um, not just uh, physically, but emotionally and spiritually restored. I saw uh, the power of God manifested in these lives. And I think it's because, you know, some people say, well, do you have to go to a third world nation to see these things? I don't believe that. But I do believe that sometimes these people um, the amount of their faith is so strong mm. because they have to believe in a miracle. They have to believe that God yep. is real. They have to believe that something, that there's an answer out there. They don't have a choice. That's See, true. we have choices. We can, we can kind of go without God for a while and survive for a little bit. Exactly. These guys don't have a choice, man. So that was so, just so, like it was in Africa. I mean, yeah. the, the level of faith that was in those villages, the vibration was so intense because yeah. these people every single day are facing life or death. Right. So there's no materialism, there's nothing around no, no. and that's going to take them and distract them right. from the purpose of their life. It's like, yeah. I need to survive. Exactly. It's God and me. Exactly. So when I show up, you know, I'm 6'3", white dude with long blonde hair, seeing this in their little town. So when I look at them and I tell them, when I touch you, the power of God is going to show up and you're going to be healed. They believe it. Mm -hmm. So whether you believe that's the power of God or if it's just quantum physics or if it's just your own mind and your own body healing itself, to me, it's all the same thing. It's just semantics. But it's the, healing, the, the, right? It's if people healing. are getting healed, I'm cool with that, whatever way that's, it comes. That's the point. Uh, there's a scripture in the Bible where, you know, this kid, they, they, they were, he didn't know what to say about Jesus. He's like, I can't tell you if he's the son of God or not. All I can tell you is I was blind, but now I can see. And that's what I tell people. So with these guys in the Philippines, they had to believe it. And so I saw the power of God show up. So it wasn't just faith, it was, it was that they really bought into the idea um, that there's something greater out there, something bigger out there that can touch their life, and it did. And um, it, it in turn, it touched my life. And that's, that's one of the catalyst moments for me that absolutely helped me know that God is real. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty here because you and I had a lot of conversations that I thought people would think are very interesting. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about what happened most recently with your father and the church. So our church has been um, established for about 30 years, started in uh, 1985. Uh, you know, my dad started it in a little town called Conyers here in Georgia. So, you know, it's kind of like rural, like rural and just super like, you know, kind of backwoods a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the people are, are backwoods in their thinking. But we came in with this radical love message. And my dad came in in 1985 and just revolutionized the town. Uh, the church grew from 5 to 10 to 300 to 3,000. And so we were just doing amazing things in the community, doing some awesome stuff. And, you know, like every church, you go through changes and you go through different things. But one of the changes um, we did go through is uh, my dad coming out. And so he came out uh, in 2010. It was October. Actually, last week would have been the anniversary of that. And so he kind of shared his truth about himself and his sexuality. And it went viral. It went on uh, CNN. The View talked about it. I mean, it was all over YouTube. And we actually were the ones that first put it on YouTube, so it's not like we were hiding it or anything like that. But he uh, really felt come out with that truth because of most of the teen suicides that were happening at that time. Um, in the media, it was like gay teen suicides. I mean, that, that happens all the time, but it was just very saturated for those few weeks. And he was like, you know what? I need to be truthful about this. His life. And in turn, it actually did help some lives. So with that transition, um, the church went through some changes. 
and you know, obviously our family went through transitions. And so, you know, it, it was it was tough, but um, but we're here today, and we're a strong family, and we're pushing through, and we're changing the world in our in our own ways. Um, but I'm not going to say it was easy. I'm not going to say that it was just you know uh, no transitional elements to it. Um, it was very impactful for my life and for the lives of the people of the church. But I think that the fact that my dad um, came out with his truth without a scandal, because see, a lot of people they, it takes them a scandal, it takes somebody catching them in some lie or some exactly. uh, you know th- you know event that has happened. For him, it was just like, dude, like, this is me. You know what I mean? This is me, and this is who I am, and hopefully it can impact someone's life. And if you guys don't understand, I'm sorry that you don't understand, but I have to be truthful for myself. And so you have to respect him for that. Yeah, and what I think is really interesting is uh, in the Christian community, people always try and hide that. They're like, you know, because oh, yeah. it says what it says in the Bible and, you know, right. about homosexuality. So give me a little bit of your perspective, maybe prior to him coming out and then now on you, homosexuality you, you, yeah on homosexuality because you actually are very outside of the box yeah, when it comes I'll, to um a, a normal christian guy from atlanta yeah i would i would say so um for me i've always been cool with gay people and never had a problem or anything like that uh and that's one reason is because i was raised that way i mean my, my dad and my mom raised me to treat everyone equally no matter their race sexuality uh creed or religion and so we've always just seen people as people you know what i mean you're not gay or straight you're just a person so for me, I never had an issue with that. Um, when my dad came out, it just even strengthened that even more. You know, a lot of people say that you could be influenced into being gay or something like that. I don't buy into that. But my dad has influenced me in a million ways, uh, artistically, musically, and ministry-wise. But when he came out, I wasn't like, yo, I got to go date a dude. You know what I mean? Like, nah, like, I, like I'm attracted to girls. You know what I mean? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so you can't, I don't believe you can be influenced into that. I think that it's either who you are or it's who you're not. And so, I don't believe in a God that would hate you for who you are. I don't believe in a God that would punish his kids and who he's created in the image of himself just for telling the truth about themselves. Uh, there are scriptures in the Bible, a handful that you could condemn people with, but I could condemn you with a lot of scriptures. I could condemn myself with a lot of scriptures. Um, Paul says that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. In other words, the letter, what he's talking about in the original language is the literal. So he says the literal kills. If you take the scripture literally, yeah. it's literally like stones that you throw at someone's head. And um, so for me, I, I think that if we start pointing fingers, um, we're all going to be dead. We're all going to be wiped out. We're all going to be excluded from the love of God. But I think that God's love reaches every single person in the earth, including gay people. It's not any, you know, any different. Um, so for me, you know, that's kind of how I, I love the Bible. I think it's inspired by God. I do not mm-hmm. believe it's infallible. I don't believe that every little thing is perfect in it. I don't believe that every little thing applies to us today. And anyone who says that it does, either isn't following that or it hasn't read the Bible. You know, Jesus said, cut off your hand if it offends you. He said, pluck out your eye if it offends you, if it causes you to sin. No, I've never met a Christian in my life that has like walking around with nubs or blinded eyes from their own hand. So we don't buy into that. We don't follow that. Some of that stuff is metaphorical. Some of it is, uh, you know, it relates to us today by the spirit of it, but the letter of it does not relate to us today. We do not buy into that's supported biblically. We do not buy into um, <laughs> some of the abominations that it lists as far as like, you know, dietary uh, regulations and stuff yeah. like, yeah, and restrictions and different things. Like that. I'll give you a lot of examples, but the bottom line is I believe that the love of God is so strong and so big that it reaches every single person, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done in your life, God loves you. So what do you think about some of the Christians that believe because they are believers that almost like they're above above the rest yeah. of the world or no, it's, it, it's it's hilarious it's hilarious it's like a joke that's funny but it, it's a joke that's not funny is really what it is it's like people are like christianity has turned into this beast to where people literally they go sit in pews and they don't do anything for the world uh you know i've heard it said i think john f kennedy said as, as well as a bunch of other people it's better to light a candle than to sit and curse the darkness and that's our whole concept with ignite yeah, yeah, is that yeah. we may not be able to eliminate all the darkness but you know what i can do i can light this candle right here and it's going to eliminate the darkness around me so it's so much better to light that candle than to sit you know so many people come in and it's nothing against church i love church i grew up in church i'll probably be in church the day i die but people come in they sit down and they don't do anything they just curse the darkness just i don't like that darkness i don't like what that person was doing i don't like what that person was doing and they never yeah. actually get up and feed someone. They never actually get up and clothe somebody. They never visit someone in the hospital. They never visit someone uh, in prison. And so when Jesus, like I said earlier in Matthew 25, when he defines that as righteousness, then to me it's not about uh, what someone is doing with their life or who they are or what they smoked or these, these trivial type things. Those things may not be good for your life, 
You know, Paul also says that all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. I think that's such a powerful message. So people always mm. accuse us of, well, you're just telling people they can do whatever they want to do. Well, first of all, we're not called to tell people what they can and can't do. We're not the Jesus police. We're not like, you know, this isn't like <laughs> Nazi Germany. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you, have, you have the freedom to do whatever you want and God's going to love you. There are consequences to your actions. If I go do drugs, God's going to love me, but I might hurt my body. I might end up in jail. I might um, die. So I don't want to do drugs, not because I'm scared of God, but because I love myself. That's being motivated out of love and not fear. So for me, I would tell those Christians, be motivated out of love. You know what I mean? Don't condemn people. Don't sit and curse the darkness. Light a candle. It's so much more powerful for your life. You're not called to change somebody. If you feel like someone needs to change just because you don't understand them, all you need to do is love that person. And if they need to be changed, God will change them. But to me, I think that's God's job and not ours. So it's not my job to sit here and point fingers at people. It's my job to sit here and light a candle. All right. I like that. Now let's talk about sex. (laughs) (laughs) because you were the first real christian that i knew that was like sex is all good and i was like what i don't know i thought you weren't supposed to have sex (laughs) (laughs) i don't know if i put it that way i would say this about about sex and i've I've said this um to the teenagers that i pastored you know if you take me on record i'm always going to say wait till marriage that's the obviously the best option that's the best uh route that you could take most responsible route um, because of obvious situations. But when you de- when you actually deal with teenagers on a daily basis, you understand that people are going to do what they're going to do. So you can sit there and tell them not to press a red button, but guess what? They're going to press a red button, and that's all that makes them want to do is when you tell them not to do something. So my philosophy about sex is instead of telling people not to do it, let's tell them how to respect, their, respect themselves enough to protect themselves. That might, be, that might mean staying abstinent. That might mean waiting till marriage. That might mean just protecting your body. Um, from an unwanted pregnancy or from a STD. So I think that we need to look at this issue more realistically rather than just judgmentally and just like looking at people like, nah, you can't have sex or you can't do this. It goes back to what I said earlier. I'm not in the business to tell people what they can and cannot yeah. do. I'm here to tell people to love themselves, value their life, mm-hmm. and respect it enough to protect themselves. Awesome, awesome, awesome. You also um, showed me a video when we were in Vegas that I thought was really cool, and it was Mind of Christ. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think uh, it was a video of me talking about the difference between the mind of Jesus and the mind of Christ. And the reason I talk about this sometimes is because I love Jesus and we learn so much from Jesus. But even Jesus himself said, I have to go so that he can come. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. So I think sometimes we get so focused on the man, Jesus, who was an amazing being. He was a pioneer. He was a philosopher. He was um, the the son of God and the son of man. And he was the, the great example. But sometimes we focus too much and we stop right there that we don't see who was Jesus talking about when he said, I've got to get out of the way so that he can come. We need to focus on the bigger picture, not just look at a man, but look at the spirit of God. The spirit of God transcends all religion, all race, all sexuality. Um, it's, It's almost like music. It goes everywhere. Everyone can enjoy it. Everyone can tap into it. So when we try to box it in, as long as we're looking at a man, we're always going to box it in. Whatever is seen is temporary, but whatever is unseen is eternal. Jesus is temporary. Christ is eternal. So I believe that, you know, some people will tell you, like, some people literally think that Jesus' last name was Christ. You know what I mean? Like, it was like on his, you know, they like write it at his letters when he was going to school or something. And it's like, dude, like, Christ is, is the spirit of God. It's what you, t- it's that energy, that mindset. You can call it universe. I don't care what kind of lang- uh, language you want to use. But for me, it's the spirit of God and it transcends all people. And so that's the difference. So Jesus set the example. But even he said, guys, I got to go so that he can come. Because as long as you're focused on me, the man, you'll never tap into the eternal spirit of God. Mm -hmm. All right. I like that. Now let's talk a little bit about your music and what you're doing with your music to ignite that vision. Definitely. So, you know, I perform at a lot of the Ignite events and I also do um, anti-bully events. So we, we travel around different schools, different everything from schools to churches to clubs to venues to festivals. Um, I'm constantly doing music. Music has been a part of my life since I was a kid. Uh, officially since I was 12, I started a band. We were together for like six or seven years. And then I was in a duo group for two years. And then I went solo just a couple years ago. And just in these few two or three years that I've been solo, amazing things have happened. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. it's just accelerated. And so God has brought so many awesome connections into my life, not just open doors, but knock down walls. And that's what I want to do with my music is not just open up. I don't want to just sit here and knock on doors. I want to knock down walls. And so music is so powerful. 
specifically mm-hmm. hip-hop. And I don't just do hip-hop, but I, I like to focus on hip-hop because it's literally the most influential style of music. Someone releases a new hip-hop song with a hook, and we start saying the words that they use. You know what I mean? It becomes mm-hmm. our lingo. It becomes our language. And so if you can affect the way people think and speak, you'll affect what they end up doing and how they live their lives. And if they're living it in a positive way, then what, what better thing is that? So for me, music is just an influential tool uh, to change the world. And so I've been blessed to be able to do it. I can rap. I can sing a little bit. I can play some piano. I can play some guitar, make a little beats. And so for me, I just like <laughs> to use what God has given me to impact the world and to show them that God loves them. And it's not, that's not to say that it's all Jesus, 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 because to me, it's just positive music. And what positive music means is if it's not negative, it's positive. So some songs are about love. Some songs are a dance song. I wrote a song about Kool-Aid one time. It was like, give me some of that Kool-Aid. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like that. So I, I, I've written all across the board. And then sometimes I'll talk about God. But to me, you can't label music into uh, secular and sacred. I don't think there's a, a, a difference. I think that music is music. And if, as long as it's not negative, it's positive. And so for me, I try to display that through my music. I think it's a powerful tool uh, to help change the world. All right, so now you have to give us a little taste. Oh, God. All right. <laughs> Sorry to put you at the spot, but go. I got you. I'm running so many circles around your turtles like hurdles. I'm jumping the first stripper girls like Jesse Owens. I'm unnerving. I'm freaking Nazis. I'm fertile, constantly birthing and murdering. I keep going and going eternally, giving the turns up for gerbils. I'm rabbit. It's habit. Gotta have it worse than nerds. How to have Urkel. I'm trying to convert y'all, but y'all more stubborn than a mule. Calling me your, gonna depress because they need more. Feed your. Stuff on the Bazillion official chronicles, they made about me because they chronically hate me. It's jealousy. They want to see me go barnacles, but barnacles it is. Then here I go. All the way from the bottom of the sea. Seek I'm a sea star under a rock that Petrock and by the rising from the ashes. Phoenix it's magic. Y'all are too stubborn to be dicked you simple-minded jackasses, backstabbers, dirty rat bastards, you've forgotten who your daddy is, master creator Ja, he created me a track star, and this is NASCAR, I'm burning ya, y'all were created to stop, and I was created to rock, cause I'm keeping the crooked and cricket and bubbing and making the music another year loving like cannabis under for running, and nobody's ever done it like I did it, <laughs> Jace will. <laughs> <laughs> a, little white boy rap Woo! a little white boy rapper. No, you're amazing. I love oh, it. Stop Thank that. you. You're like, stop that. No, you're amazing. I told you. When we were in Vegas, you killed it. Thank you. Thank you. It Where was were fun. we? We were at an uh, art bar? What was the name no. of it? Oh, don't tell mama. Mama, yeah, that place is dope. I love that place. So let's tell everybody. So we go in, everyone's singing like Broadway tunes, John yeah, yeah. Legend tunes, you know, the hottest new things out there. And we're like, all right, so Judy, you going to go up and do something? Yeah. So he got up and crushed it. And everyone was like, what? Because Chris, Chris, Who was, is like, this guy? Chris was like, oh, I'm about to put down like $40 and just buy everybody's time. So we're like, all right, let's do it. So every song I would turn in, the guy was like, I don't know this song. I don't know that song. So I was like, dude, just give me a tempo and I'm going to rap. And we did it. And it was like really cool. And like, I don't think Vegas was ready. Like they weren't ready for that yet. It was a lot of fun. Oh, my God. It was awesome. Everyone had a really great time. Yeah, so yeah, listen, yeah. where can everyone go check out your music? Yeah, you can check out my music at officialjudah.com. So that's officialjudah.com. Not Judas. I did not kill Jesus. I was like his great, 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 great <laughs> granddaddy, something like that. So check it out, Official Judah. It's got all my you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. All, they're all the same, Official Judah. So just check it out. Link up with me. I would love to connect with uh, anybody out there. And also, um, is that where we can learn more about Ignite? Yep. You can, uh, it'll link you to Ignite, but you can also go ignitetheworld.org. So ignitetheworld.org, if you want to go directly there, you can learn about our events. we got one coming up here uh, this week, and we've got um, all the time we're doing stuff in Atlanta, and we're actually going to spread out to other cities. So if you'd like us to come to your city, let us know. Um, we've been in Ohio, we've been in Atlanta, and we want to spread out to all the way to New York and to L.A. and possibly even internationally soon. So we definitely want to connect with anybody out there, ignitetheworld.org. Yeah, well, if you, we'll talk about New York um, on a side note, because I would love to help you out with that as yeah, well. definitely. Now, really quickly, what is the vision for, you know, your, your Ignite, for your music? Um, I know you're even in talks for a possible um, TV show. So what's the next, um, what's the vision for the next five years? The next five years, I would say I'm going to be doing what I'm doing now, just on a larger scale. So it's not like I don't see myself doing necessarily totally different things. I just see what we're doing now just on a grand scale, like an influential um, level to where we can absolutely impact the world. So the music is going to be at a different level. Uh, the, The ministry and outreach and nonprofit different level production company whole other level so we're, we're going to be doing this and just take it to that next step and so in five years uh look out for where we're at it's going to be an amazing time i'm so excited 
we've got the game plan and we're just trusting God with it. We're going to go full force with energy, love, and passion. And we're going to see this thing absolutely happen. Talk a little bit about your production. I don't think we covered that yet. Yeah, definitely. So Swilly and Air Productions, obviously Swilly and Air comes from my name. We had to like develop that, but uh, uh, we, we do everything from video to photography to DJ. We DJ events and weddings and corporate events and stuff like that. And it's a lot of fun. It kind of happened out of just me being an artist and some of my friends asking me to DJ their weddings. And so I was like, yeah, I'll come DJ your wedding. But then I started realizing, yo, you can actually make money from this. And it's kind of fun. So I built a team of people. We send people out. Um, I've got a great team of, of DJs and videographers. Uh, we shoot music videos. We shoot wedding videos, uh, corporate videos, marketing videos, all kinds of stuff. Um, and so it's, it's really exciting. It, you know, and that kind of developed from the music as well because we do all our own uh, music videos in-house. So artists started asking us, hey, can you do my mu music video? Yeah. Can you do my music? Developed into something really fun. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, Swilly and Air and just kind of developing that and seeing where that goes. You know, the possibilities are endless. Yeah, and everyone should, who's listening should check out your YouTube channel because you have some hysterical videos up there. <laughs> Tell them about the last one you just did. It was um, the, the spoof of the Gangnam oh, the <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did a uh, remix. I did a little, uh, little, little uh, remix of Gangnam Style, and we called it Atlanta Style because, you know, Gangnam is actually a place in Korea. But um, Atlanta style, man, it was great. Like we went out on location. We filmed a lot of places in Atlanta. I kind of like describe Atlanta to you if you've never been. Um, if anyone's out there has never been and they watch the video, they'll kind of learn history about Atlanta. And so as we're out, like we linked up with Jeff Foxworthy. He got in the music video. He helped promote it. It got on NBC. Like we did a lot of different promotions with it. And it was, it was just a lot of fun. You know, people were searching for game style and they came across ours. So we got a whole lot of hits off of it. And it was just a really, it was a really fun time, really fun video. So now I know how you feed your, your spirit, right? You've got God, you've got your music. How do you feed your body and how do you feed your mind? My body, okay, let's start there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting better at that. That's something that I'm working on because I do, you know, I eat my like veggies and stuff like this, I eat my fruits. But uh, sometimes I eat my Doritos at like two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. When you're living a music lifestyle, man, sometimes it's like you go to bed so super late and you end up just kind of finding something on the road. And so you really have to make it a point uh, my brother and I were talking about this the other day. Like, you have to make it a point to eat healthy when you're on the road because it's just really hard. Um, so, I, I, you know, I'm not going to say I'm, I've mastered that yet, but I'll say that I'm working on that with my body. Um, I try to be as healthy as I can because if, if I'm not going to be healthy, then I can't help anybody else. I can't do anything. That's right. If you don't have your health, you really don't have anything. And I, you I know that. You don't have health, you have nothing. Exactly. I'll help you with that. I appreciate that. And so, <laughs> with, my, with my mind, uh, I would just say, like, I, you know, some people call it meditation, but for me, it's just worship. Like, I get in the presence of God. I've been in corporate worship. I know when it's fake. I know when it's phony. I know how to make it phony. I know how to make you feel like you felt God and you really didn't, and we were all just phoning it in. But I also know when it's real, and I know when God shows up. Mm -hmm. And so when I feel God one-on-one, -on -one, when I'm alone with my guitar and my piano and I'm singing to God, and there's this, tran uh, this transfer of energy and, and just like you're feeling down and depressed, but all of a sudden you feel alive and happy and, and passionate— I know that that's real, and so that's what helps my mind is is to to kind of get in with myself, see God, see myself, and how the two can uh, be there for each other, love each other, and connect. And not only for yourself, but one thing that helps my mind is just doing things for other people. You know what I mean? When you give, it's almost like you're giving to yourself because mm -hmm. it's this transfer of energy that's just um, it's like unexplainable. So. If anybody's out there having trouble with your mind, maybe you're having depression, like I battled that, I battled suicide, all that kind of stuff. If you're battling any of that, go do something for somebody and it'll lift you up. It'll change your life. Because for me, like that's what made my life change. You know, Go feed somebody, go clothe somebody, go teach somebody or tell them that, they, that God loves them or that you love them or that they're special or they're valuable. And it'll absolutely help your mind. Yeah, well, that was, that was my next question. I think you answered it. But if anything comes up for you, it was if there's anybody who's listening who's struggling with, yeah. um, with their own faith or just struggling in life, uh, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I would say find your purpose. Find mm -hmm. who you are. Um, if you don't know who you are, then you'll let people around you define you. And the problem with that is a lot of people have really bad definitions. You know, people are walking around and they'll tell you you're ugly or you're, you're fat or you're no good or you're um, stupid or you're dumb or you're worthless. And so sometimes we hear these definitions and we're like, okay, I'll take that on and I'll become that. And if you know who you are, um, you can absolutely change the world. You can change your world. 
And so for me, I didn't know who I was until I knew whose I was. When I had a relationship with God, that's what helped me. You know, a relationship with God might not be your answer. I don't know. I can't speak for you. I just know that that was it for me because I knew that God loved me so I could love myself. I knew that I was worthy of loving myself, which made me, you know, confident enough to love others. So if anyone's struggling with depression, man, like talk to somebody, reach out to me on my YouTube or on my Twitter and, and Instagram and stuff like that. I'm not a licensed counselor, but I'd love to like talk with you and be there for you. Um, and don't. Don't hold it in. I think us, especially even as white people, man, like white people are like really bad at this. Like we, we hold stuff in and we just explode, you know, like, yeah. like we get bullied or we get treated badly. And then sometimes it explodes in a school or sometimes it explodes in a movie theater like we saw a couple of years ago. And so like things happen and you have to vent. You have to let it out. You have to talk to someone. You have to get it out. Just hold it in yourself. Use that energy. Energy is just energy. There's no such thing to me as positive or negative. It's just energy and how you perceive it. So take that, even if it's negative energy that you perceive it as, and convert it into something positive. And that'll absolutely change your life. So know who you are. Know mm. your purpose. Find something you're passionate about. If you don't have anything that you could think of that you're good at, just go love somebody. Help somebody. And that will be your calling. That will be your purpose. And that will make you passionate about life. Well, thank you. Again, tell everyone where they can check you out. Yes. So officialjuda.com, J-U-D-A-H. Don't miss it. Uh, I'm on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that kind of good stuff, Official Judah. And uh, you can connect with me on there. And I would love to uh, see you guys and, and work with you guys in the future. Thank you for tuning in. And make sure you subscribe to this channel to get your weekly fix for all you spiritual gangsters. Any questions or comments, go to my site at taramagalski.com. Drop me a note. I'd love to hear from you. And stay tuned for next week. I got the good stuff.